Well, does it feel like life is sort of shifting into a higher gear? Yeah? School's starting up, and so suddenly there's homework and sports practices and music practices and PTO and all sorts of things to be doing, homework and grading and things like that. At the workplace, uh, it may feel like uh, summer is ending and now people are back from vacation and projects that were sort of on hold are now moving forward. There's more traffic out there. Things are busier. Instead of vacations, you're now taking business trips or doing those kinds of things. At church, it often feels like things are ramping way up. Here we are at three services, which again, I'm grateful for. But it takes some endurance uh, and it takes some getting used to again. But Wednesday night programming, starting up choir and orchestra, seniors luncheon, Bible study, small groups, Sunday school classes, all wonderful things. But sometimes in September, we can come face to face with the fact, this is a busy month. This is a busy time of year. And if you're feeling like, wow, all of a sudden there's lots of tasks to be done, I've got a word of encouragement for you. Sometimes it feels like we're just doing stuff. But you know what? When we work, God works with us. He works alongside of us, and a lot of times we don't see him. But he's at work, and when you're practicing uh, music lessons, you may think, I'm just trying to go through the discipline of learning this instrument. But God's at work while you're working, and he's training you, and he's blessing you, and he's going to use the music uh, ability that you're gaining to bless you and others. Maybe you're a lawyer and you've been doing lawyering work and you think you're just trying to work through this next deal and you're working hard to get it done. I'm here to tell you God's at work with you. If you know Jesus is your Savior, He's working alongside of you. And what you're doing, you're not just honing your craft. God's using that to bless you and to bless others. And He's at work with you. And I just want to say a word of encouragement when you're dropping kids off and running everywhere, when you're writing notes of encouragement, when you're cleaning house, when you're cooking, when you're doing all of the stuff, God works with us while we do things. That's one of the prime ways that he works. We get busy doing stuff. He's working alongside of us. So I want you to be encouraged. At this time of year when there's so many things to do, that's not taking you away from the Lord. That's giving God an opportunity to work alongside of you. But I also want you to know that that's not the only way God works. God works in and through us as we do tasks, but there are also times where God works apart from us, where God does something and we're simply along for the ride. It's not us working with him, it's him working for us, and we simply get to sit back and watch. And sometimes at this time of year when it's so busy and all these tasks are coming, it's important to be reminded that while God does work in and through our tasks, there are some things that he does apart from all the stuff we're doing. It's that aspect of God's work that we want to talk about this morning. So please take a Bible and turn to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. In the Bibles the church provides, it's page 172. If you don't have a Bible, if you just reach down in the rack in front of you or look under your seat, turn to page 172. We'll be in Joshua chapter 6. Now this is a bit unusual for us as a church. We normally are starting a new sermon series in September, but we're already in the middle of a sermon series this September. And so if you're new here this week or you've been gone for the summer, if you've missed uh, various weeks during the summer, let me catch you up to where we are in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua is about the children of Israel and God leading them out of Egypt, out of bondage and captivity, to a land that he's promised to them. Now there was a generation that he brought out of Egypt who came to the edge of the promised land, looked into it, saw how difficult it was be, and basically said to God, no thank you. They turned their backs and said, we don't want to go in, we don't want to trust you. God had the children of Israel wander around in the wilderness for a generation until that generation was gone. 
God then raised up another generation who was faithful to them, brings them to the edge of the promised land, and that's the book of Joshua. He's going to take them across the Jordan River. We've already seen that happen. And they're going to come into the land of Canaan, the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Where we are in the story is they've crossed the Jordan River. They've gone through the rite of circumcision. They've celebrated Passover in faith. And they're coming to the city of Jericho, which is the first battle that's going to take place in the conquest of the land. Now the most important thing for us as we go through the book of Joshua is to understand this is not a glorified history lesson. This is the Word of God, and through the Word of God, God is speaking to us today. And while we're looking at the story of Israel, what we're listening for are instructions from God to us today, because God has said in the book of Joshua, keep this book always on your lips, meaning God's Word. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to obey everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous, then you'll be successful. And so the name of our sermon series is The Courage to Obey. And what we are wanting to do individually and as a church is to follow God in whatever way he's asking us to obey, even when it doesn't make sense, even when we're not sure how it's going to turn out, even when we're not sure where we're going to get the strength to go forward. God's promise is, if we obey, we will experience the blessings of God. So we come to this first battle, this battle of Jericho, very famous battle. Let me read you Joshua 6, verses 1 to 5, which will kind of give you the sense of how this battle uh, was to be fought. Joshua 6, verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Jump down to verse 20. When the trumpets sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in and they took the city. So here we have some very unusual instructions for the battle of Jericho. God has said to the children of Israel, what I want you to do is one time each day for six days, march around the city of Jericho, the priests leading the way, blowing their trumpets, and then on the seventh day, I want you to march seven times around the city, so 13 times total. And they were told in the story that at the last time, on that 13th time, uh, the walls collapsed in, collapsed in and they were able to conquer the city of Jericho. There's four observations that we need to make from this story in order to be able to live it out today. The first comes out of verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. The narrator has made this point to remind us that the city of Jericho is in many ways the Israelites' worst fear. Remember, a previous generation had come to the edge of the promised land. They had looked into the promised land, sent spies. The spies came back and gave them a report. When the people of the previous generation heard the report about the land, they said, no, thank you. We're not going into the land. Well, the thing that they heard about, Deuteronomy 1 verse 28 tells us what it is that they were so scared of. They said, now this is the previous generation, where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say, the spies, the people are stronger 
and taller than we are. The cities are large with what? Walls up to the sky. Jericho is a walled city. This is what the Israelites were most afraid of. The reason they're most afraid of this is that the Israelites have no recourse to be able to handle a walled city. And the narrator is reminding us that Jericho, which is the most strategic city in the land at this point, this is a walled city. And the Israelites are terribly afraid of walled cities. Why? Well, because they don't know anything about siege warfare. If this was the later Roman army or the Greek army, the Assyrian army, they wouldn't be excited about a walled city either, but they would simply summon a siege engineer. They would set up siege works. They'd build a ramp, have a battering ram, have catapults, whatever it may be. They would lay siege to the city, and it might take a couple of months, but they would ultimately be victorious because the Romans and the Greeks and the Assyrians, they're skilled in siege warfare. The Israelites are not. They fought a few battles in open conflict, but they've just spent 400 some years in Egypt in captivity. They don't have any siege weapons. They don't have any siege engineers. When they come to a walled city, they have no idea how in the world they're going to be able to conquer the city. That's why they're so afraid of walled cities. And so here we are at Jericho, with the Israelites facing their worst fear. That may be one of the reasons why God wanted them to march around the city 13 times. So that they could see up close and personal again and again and again just how high those walls were. Just how impregnable the fortress is. Just how difficult a task this was going to be. By the 13th time around the city, they are well aware that this thing is impregnable. That they are ill-equipped to be able to fight this battle on their own. But that leads to the second observation from the text, which is in verse 2. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. As we go through the rest of the book of Joshua, we're going to run into more normal kinds of battles. What I mean by normal kinds of battles, it's those Israel works and God works with them. Israel does the kinds of things that you would expect them to do. They lay out strategy. They draw battle lines. They draw their swords. They go into battle. They fight. Sometimes they're tired. Sometimes it's overwhelming. It's what you think of as a normal battle. Jericho is not that. It's not one of those things where God comes alongside of them and works. It's one of those things where God says, that's an impregnable fortress for you, but I will deliver it into your hands. This is not a God works with us. This is a God works for us kind of situation. That's why when they march around the city, what's leading them is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represents God's presence. There's going to be lots of battles in the, in the book of Joshua where the ark isn't part of the battle. But at Jericho, something different is happening. Something different is happening, and God is the one who's leading them in battle. And just like I said at the beginning of the sermon, praise the Lord that he's with us when we're working, that one of the ways God works is that we do our work, and he works alongside of us. Jericho is not that kind of thing. Jericho is one of those things where God is going to do the work and the Israelites are going to show up for the cleanup. The walls are going to come down because God's going to knock them down. And before they even start, God has said, I've delivered the city into your hands. That's why in verse number 10, the instructions, Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling at once. He's describing day one here. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. See, when they're marching around the city, 
they're not even supposed to speak. The point is, this is not an intimidation tactic. They're not walking around the city whooping and hollering and doing war cries and war chants so that everybody in the city of Jericho is quake. They're quietly walking around the city. The only noise is the seven priests are blowing the seven ram's horns as they go around the city, but the people are being silent. And in fact, they start, they do this first thing in the morning, then they go back to camp, hang out, and go to bed. And the point you're supposed to get from this is that Israel's not doing anything. They are doing nothing working for themselves to defeat the city. They're not even trying to intimidate the people. This is God from beginning to end. Now again, there'll be lots of battles where it will be Israel's job to draw up plans, it will be Israel's job to go into battle, it will be Israel's job to make sure they've got their sword sharpened and they're ready to go. But Jericho is not one of those. Jericho is one of those situations where God says, you sit over there, I'm going to do the work. I'm going to be the one who leads us to victory here. Does that mean that Israel had no responsibilities whatsoever? No, that leads us to observation number three. There was something that Israel was supposed to do. They were supposed to march. And the third observation that's important for us is the timing of their marching. God gives very specific orders about how this is supposed to happen. In verse 12, we find out Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Israel didn't sort of wake up, start their day, eat breakfast, read the newspaper, do a few things, and then sometime in the afternoon when everybody felt like it, walk around the city. No, this is the very first thing that they did, and the timing is important. The very first thing in the morning during the first six days, they get up and walk around the city. The other piece of timing that's important is that on the seventh day, they walk seven times around the city. Now, the seventh day in the Jewish calendar is their Sabbath, another indication that this was going to be God at work and not them at work. But basically, the big event has been moved to their day of worship. The Sabbath is not only a day of rest, it's a day of worship. And it's very important that at the Battle of Jericho, Early in the morning for six days, they're walking around. And then on the day of worship, they really walk around the place seven times. Observation number four. While they're marching around, there is some noise that's happening. And the noise, seven priests are blowing trumpets. Now in Israel, these are not trumpets like we think. They're not musical instruments. Okay, so they're not like playing songs. They're not playing jo Joshua fought the battle of Jericho as they're going around the city. What trumpets did in ancient Israel is they essentially did two things. They announced something or they summoned someone. These are noisemakers and they're designed to get people's attention. And so the blowing of the trumpets is announcing something and summoning something. So really what they're doing when they're walking around the city, what the trumpets represent, is them summoning God to come and do the work. They're walking around not doing anything, but they are asking God to come do something. And while they're asking him to come do something, they're also announcing that he will do something, even though it hasn't happened yet. This is essentially worship and prayer. What the Israelites are doing at the battle of Jericho, which is different from all the rest of the battles of the book of Joshua, is they are substituting worship and prayer for work. There will be a time when the children of Israel need to do their part and God will do his part and they will work together. But this is a battle where worship and prayer have been substituted for the work. And so when they're walking around blowing their trumpets, they are summoning God and celebrating in faith what God is going to do. So to summarize, Jericho is their worst fear. It's a walled city. 
God has promised that he will deliver them. This is one of those things where God is going to do it for them, not with them. The timing of what they're doing is very important. First thing in the morning, six days of the week. But a real strong emphasis on the day of worship. And then fourth, they're blowing their trumpets, which means they are summoning and announcing God. They've exchanged work for worship and prayer. Now, how do we obey Joshua 6 today? How do we keep this from being a glorified history lesson? Whereby we listen and go, that's really great. That's really cool that God did that for the children of Israel. Because this is written not just for them. This is written so that God can speak to us. So the question is, how do you and I obey Joshua chapter 6 today? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to identify if there are any Jerichos in our lives. What I mean by that is, like I said at the beginning of this sermon, one of the normal ways that God works is we get busy about our tasks, and God works alongside of us, and sometimes we don't even know that he's there. We're just simply going through practice, we're doing our homework, we're going to work, we're making meals, whatever it may be, we're just laboring, and God's right there with us, sometimes invisible to us. Jericho situations, though, are those situations in which God is doing the work for us. That's something different. And the question is, are you facing any Jericho situations in your life? We've been talking about the assignment that God has given you. Is there an aspect of that assignment that's a Jericho situation? You say, well, how do I know? Well, a couple of clues. If the thing that you're facing scares you to death, it may be a Jericho situation. After all, this walled city is the Israelites' worst fear. If you for a long time have been afraid about losing your job, if you're wondering how in the world would I make it if I didn't have a job, and you've lost your job, this may very well be a Jericho situation. If for a long time you've been afraid of losing a loved one and you think to yourself, how in the world am I going to make it with this loved one not here? How am I going to fill the void when they're gone? How am I going to handle the loneliness at night? How in the world would I ever survive without them here? It may be that that's a Jericho situation because your worst fear is what you're being faced with right now. Another clue is if you're beginning something a journey of faith, something God's asked you to do, and something really difficult happens at the beginning. Satan loves to nip things in the bud before they get going. This is why he has Herod try to kill all the babies two years and under. He's trying to kill Jesus before he can grow up and do what Jesus is going to do. It's why at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, Satan comes to tempt him. He's trying to stop what happens at the beginning before it gets going. Maybe you've recently adopted a child, and God worked miraculously for you to be able to get that child, and you've got that child home, and within a month or two of having that child home, he or she gets very, very sick. That may very well be a Jericho situation. Jericho is the first city they're coming to in the land. There will be lots of other places where they'll simply work, and God will work with them. But the first place they go to in the land, that's a place where God has to do something because they're powerless. It may be that you are uh, going through, you've just recently got married, and suddenly your spouse is out of work, or you find out that you're being transferred, and you had planned on your family being around to be able to help you in this new marriage situation, and now you've had to move into a new location. That may very well be a new Jericho, or Jericho situation. Maybe it's the start of a new school year. And Satan right now is trying to bring incredible discouragement to you in the middle of the beginning of the school year because he's afraid of what's going to happen this school year. That may very well be a Jericho situation. Another clue? If there's something you're facing that you normally would be good at handling on your own, but for whatever reason, God is not letting you handle it on your own, that may be a Jericho situation. Remember, the children of Israel are completely silenced as they walk around the city. 
Maybe you're somebody who's got the gift of administration. And you look at your next few months and you think, wow, there's a lot going on. But I'll do what I normally do. I'll get up early in the morning. I'll make my list. I'll plan it all out and I'll start working on my task. But for whatever reason, in this situation, this thing that you're facing, you can't seem to get that list made. You can't seem to get those tasks done. No amount of organization seems to solve this problem. It may be because this is a Jericho situation. Not the rest of the battles in the book of Joshua, but Jericho. Maybe you're really good at talking to people face to face and confrontation doesn't bother you. And there's a person that you've been thinking about sitting down uh, to talk with because there's an interpersonal conflict. But for whatever reason, God won't give you the freedom to do it. You simply can't sit down with them. You can't get the words out. That may be a Jericho situation where God is trying to say, look, I'm so thankful that you're good at talking with people. I'm so thankful that you're organized. But in this case, I want to do it. This case, I want you to sit there and I want me to do the work. Those are the ways in which you might be facing a Jericho situation. So if there's something in your life that's causing you great fear, happening at the beginning of a journey that you're starting out with the Lord, or in which God is really seeming to stop you from being able to do work, you may have a Jericho situation. If you do... How do you obey Joshua 6? Well, you walk around it blowing a trumpet. What does that mean? Well, it means you walk around the situation, metaphorically speaking, substituting worship and prayer for work. Normally, and God bless it, it'd be, it'd be wonderful. Normally, we would work. But in this situation, we don't work. We choose to walk around it with prayer. How? Well, you get up early in the morning, six days a week, and you commit it to the Lord in prayer. Now, you're probably like me, and you're like, yeah, I don't really like praying in the morning. I like to pray in the afternoon or at night or kind of when I think about it. Normally, that would be fine. But for a Jericho situation, if we're going to obey this passage, it's got to be the first thing that we do in the morning before we get up because it's a reminder before I start doing stuff today, I need God to show up because these walls aren't going to come down unless he knocks them down. And so to obey this passage, if you find yourself living this text, we have to get up early in the morning and commit the situation to prayer. Summon God to come and show up. Praise God for the deliverance that he's going to bring even before it gets there. Amen. The other thing you have to do is you've got to set aside one day of the week for worship and prayer. And on that day of the week, a stronger emphasis on the fact that the Lord is fighting for you. That's what we're doing here this morning. Every single one of you in this room could be spending your time working right now. Working to solve the problems that you're facing, working to study for a class that you need to study for, working to become more proficient at the instrument you're trying to learn, whatever it may be. You've chosen to be here and instead of working, you're praying and worshiping. This is essentially important for those Jericho type situations. Let me give you an example of what this looks like in real life. As a church, we're doing this building project that we're calling Grace Beyond. Did y'all see the banner when you came in on the front, on the fence over here? I just noticed that. That was really cool. Stuff's happening. We're actually building things. There were cranes here this week. They knocked a whole lot of them gymnasium. It was really exciting. Now, Grace Beyond is one of these things, this building project, in which there are certain aspects of it in which we're hard at work. We're doing stuff that God's told us to do and we're working at it. We're having committees and we're doing all the things we're supposed to be doing. And God's working alongside with us, sometimes in invisible sorts of ways. But there are also aspects of this Grace Beyond project, like the money raising, which are, they feel like Jericho to me. I've told you many times, this is my, one of my worst fears. I don't like doing this kind of stuff. The walls seem way too high. It seems an impossible task. There seems no way to deal with it. And really, for the past month, I've been ignoring the whole money thing. Well, we have some money. We've gotten started on phase one. We'll just get going with it. But you know what? Since the last time uh, we talked to you about Grace Beyond, since that time, 
We have received over $2 million in additional pledges towards Grace Beyond. So that our total, yeah. So the total is now somewhere around $17 million that's been pledged. Now the thing that strikes me about that, we haven't done anything with regards to money for a number of months. We've been busy with other things. And I'm announcing that to you, not because we have all of the money. I'm announcing it to you in faith because I'm saying, look, we didn't do anything. This was simply God at work. We're doing other stuff, and he's working with us over there. But in this, God was simply working, and we're sitting back watching. And I, by faith, am saying God's going to deliver this project to us. I don't know how. I don't know how it's all going to happen. But I see God at work when we're not at work. And I'm reminded there are times where we're working and God's working with us. And then there are times and there are situations where God's the one doing the work and we just have to watch. So I have an assignment for you. And the assignment is this. If you right now are facing a Jericho type situation, maybe it's an aspect of an assignment God's given you that has a Jericho uh, feel to it. Maybe it's the thing itself. Loss of a loved one. Uh, difficult financial situation. Whatever it may be. If you ha now listen, if you don't have one of those right now, praise God, that's fantastic. If you're in the mode where you're working and God's working with you, praise the Lord. Do that. But if you're facing a Jericho situation, I got two things I want you to do. Number one, I want you to commit to get up early six days this week and pray about it. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Notice I'm not saying get up early for the rest of your life. Just six days. Because the Israelites don't march around Jericho forever and ever and ever. They do it for six days. And so I'm, tell I'm asking you to get up early in the morning and take this situation and commit it to the Lord in prayer. You may thank him for things he's been doing along the way. You may praise him in faith for how he's going to bring about the deliverance. But you're asking him, Lord, only you can knock down these walls. Second part. Is that clear, first part? Amen. Great. I'm kind of in school mode, so I want to make sure. Okay, second part of the assignment. If you have a Jericho situation, in just a minute we're going to sing, uh, I think, three songs. During that time, if you don't have a current Jericho situation that you're facing, I want you to stay in your seats and I want you to praise the Lord. If you do, I want you to stand up, walk down the aisle, and come and kneel at these stairs. You're saying, well, can't I just stay in my seat? When the children of Israel marched around Jericho, it's a very public display. Right. Everybody in this city watched them do this. We're not doing this so everybody can watch you do this, but what we are doing is we're saying, look... On the day of worship, we come and summon God in a unique way. And we want to give you and I the opportunity to come down here and to cry out to God and to summon him, to blow the trumpet and say, Lord, please come knock down these walls. Lord, please come and rescue us. Lord, please come and do something. Lord, you're our only hope. And so I want to give you the opportunity this morning on the day of worship to do what Israel did, which is to come down and to summon and announce that God is your deliverer and to ask him for help.